Okay, so uh, welcome class. Uh, the last three lectures, we studied the topic of authentication. So authentication concerns the uh, uh, establishing the identity of an individual or a program uh, that is trying to accomplish something on a computer system. So we, an individual or a process is called a subject and the goal of the cryptographic cryptographic mechanisms as well as the network protocols that we studied was to primarily identify that the subject, in fact, uh, that, the, that the identity of the subject is known to the computer system. So in today's lecture, we will be studying the topic of access control, which is also called authorization, which typically happens after authentication is completed. So you know who the subject who is asking uh, to enter a particular computer system is. And with the identity of the subject established, the question of authorization concerns itself with controlling uh, whether the subject uh, or this process or a user, which is often called a principle also, uh, when it tries to access a, an object, which is uh, the name used to represent a resource, could be a file, it could be a socket, it could be a device, when the subject is trying to access the object um, and is asking for a particular kind of access, the subject of authorization concerns itself with whether that access should be allowed. That is the question of policy. And if the access should be denied, uh, then what are the mechanisms used to deny that subject uh, access, that particular kind of access to the object? So we are going to be concerning ourselves both with policy as well as mechanism. So policies generally are the question of whether a subject is allowed to access an object or not, right? It, the answer could be yes or no. And mechanism essentially concerns how that decision is enforced on the system. So generally speaking, when we talk about this subject of access control, there are two kinds of access control that come into the, into the picture. Uh, they are called mandatory access control or MAC. Unfortunately, there is an overlap of names, right? This MAC stands for mandatory access control. We have also used MAC to mean uh, uh, message authentication codes. So depending on the lecture, you will have to uh, disambiguate the term. Anyway, this is standard parlance. So there is mandatory access control and there is discretionary access control or DAC, okay? So MAC essentially concerns system-wide policies that are typically set by the system administrator and enforced on all users, okay? That sort of explains the genesis of the term mandatory. It essentially means that these access control policies are non-negotiable. They have to be applied on every user of the system, no matter what. And generally speaking, these policies are set by the system administrator to achieve some system-wide goal on all users of that system. Okay, so there are examples of Mac-based systems. Generally, you will find these in corporate settings where, you know, there is some corporate policy that has to be applied on, let's say, all the laptops that have been given to all the employees of the organization. And generally speaking, the, the mechanisms of Mac and, the, and Mac policies are also popularized in these systems like SE Linux, which uh, is short for Security Enhanced Linux. Uh, SE Android, which runs on all your Android phones, uh, and also the two policy models that we will be talking about today, which are the Bell Lapadula confidentiality model and the Baiba integrity model. Okay, so these are all going to be examples of Mac systems in the sense that you, as an end user, you, as let's say the owner of a resource on that system, do not have any freedom as to whether this policy can be applied or not on your system, it will be applied and it will be applied in the way that it's configured by the system administrator. So that is MAC. Uh, on the other hand, we have DAC or discretionary access control, which is the access control that most of us who are end users of a Linux system are familiar with, right? So, uh, the <coughs> so the read, write, execute permissions that you typically see on Linux, for example, are examples of uh, DAC access control. And the key distinguishing feature between DAC and MAC 
is that in DAC, the permissions and the access control bits are set by the resource owner. So if you own a file, you can essentially govern who else can uh, read or write or execute or in any other way access that file, okay? So it is your discretion as a resource owner to decide who is going to access your resource and in what way. And so that explains the genesis of the term discretionary access control uh, or DAC, okay? So these are the two general families of access control and they concern themselves with whether the policy is going to be applied system-wide or it's going to be applied on a resource owned by an individual principal or a subject. Uh, but those are essentially, uh, you know, how a policy is enforced uh, once you decide to enforce it. But we have to concern ourselves now with the question of how are these policies even going to be enforced, be it MAC or be it DAC, doesn't really matter. So it turns out that the core mechanism that is available uh, to, uh, uh, let's see, go to the next slide. So the core mechanism that is available to, uh, to enforce a policy, just a minute, view single page and maximize. It's okay, I think it's okay. Okay, so be it Mac or DAC, we need some sort of an enforcement mechanism. And on uh, modern systems, that mechanism to enforce policy uh, is called an access control matrix. Okay, so as the name suggests, it's a very, very simple data structure, right? You have a matrix, a two dimensional matrix, which consists of subjects. For example, every uh, column here denotes a subject. Uh, Alice is a user of the system. Bob is a user of the system. Charles is a user of the system and so on. And every row represents an object on the system, okay? So you have foo.c, bar.txt, you have the printer, you have a whole bunch of resources, uh, access to which must be monitored, okay? So you have subjects and you have objects and the entries of the matrix are essentially the kinds of access that the subject is allowed uh, on that particular object or resource. So in this case, for example, Alice owns this file foo.c and she is able to read and write the file and Bob is able to read this file but not write it. Charles is able to write the file and read it, uh, but not read it. So the principal difference between mandatory and uh, discretionary access control essentially is in who can fill up entries uh, in this access control matrix. In some sense, if it is a Mac-based system, you'll find that the entries of this access control matrix are pre-filled, for example, by the system administrator, and that you cannot delete those entries. Uh, and in a DAC-based system, the owner, for example, of this particular resource has the ability to provide these read write permissions for the resources that she owns, okay? So that's the access control matrix. And you can imagine how the system will enforce access control by, by consulting this access control matrix. Supposing this user Bob is now going to ask to let's say write to this file foo.c, the uh, system in this particular case, the operating system will go and check or the file system will go and check whether Bob has right access to that file. And here, there is no right entry and therefore Bob will be denied access. So even though I've written own, read, write and so on, each one of these different kinds of accesses can be represented by a bit, right? I mean, you will have, maybe you'll have a vector of bits and you know, the first entry determines whether you own the file, the second entry determines whether you can read or write, read from the file, the third entry determines whether you can write the file and so on, okay? Uh, and I've just shown you read and write. You know, there are other kinds of permissions. There are append permissions. There are execute permissions. There is the ability to duplicate the file. And there are so many different kinds of operations that you can think about, okay? So I've shown you only a simple version. Now, here's a question for you, right? So how do you store this access control matrix, okay? So 
I will make a claim over here that this access control matrix is rarely ever stored in this form directly, the way that you see it. And I am asked, I'm going to ask you why. Okay, so why do you think that this matrix cannot be stored in its in its in the form that I've shown you over here uh, in a computer system? <clears throat> so I'll give you an answer also. <clears throat> so let us imagine a real computer system such as the one that we have uh, in our department. <clears throat> How many users? Let's just say there are on the order of a thousand users. Okay. So that means that there will be a thousand columns over here in this access control matrix. And how many resources are you going to have? Well, you know, it's, you know, you look at your file system and you do a find dot from your root directory, you'll be surprised at the number of files that you yourself own. Okay. And, you know, if you were to, in fact, go and look at all of the resources across all of the users, it's going to be a humongous number, but let's just give ourselves an estimate. Maybe there are a million files over here or a million resources to be protected. Okay, so a thousand users and a million resources. What is the size of this uh, of this access control matrix? It is going to be a billion entries. Okay, a billion entries. And let us say that there are eight different kinds of permissions, just a lower bound that is going to be represented by one byte. Okay, eight bits. So that itself is going to take one gigabyte of storage on your system and it's got to be stored in memory. Okay, your operating system, if you remember a 32 bit machine just occupies the top one gigabyte of your process address space. Now, if you were to store your access control matrix in this particular way, then all the operating system can do is that it can load the access control matrix and then say Tata bye bye, that's it. Nothing more will work because that is going to occupy the entire memory of the virtual memory of the operating system. Okay, so the access control matrix is never stored in this raw form. You have to find cleverer ways to store it. Okay, so it so turns out that there are a few features of this access control matrix that make it easy to store. So it's a very sparse data structure and it's a very repetitive data structure. Okay, so for example, Alice is the only owner of this file and then you'll probably find that there are a large group of users who have read access, a large group of users who have write access and many users who have no access at all. Okay, so you can actually compress this data structure and it does not have to be stored in this explicit manner. So, so let's look at two popular methods that, this, uh, that are used to store this matrix. Okay, so you can see on the right hand side of the slide. So we are going to shard this matrix uh, and store it uh, in shards. So obviously if you want to store a matrix, you can store and you want to shard a matrix, you can either shard it by row or you can shard it by column. In other words, you're going to store it by row and compress each row or you're going to compress each column. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at each method. So if you're going to store it by row, and let's just take this example over here of foo.c, you will be storing all of the access permissions along with foo.c. Okay, and here is one popular way of doing it. So your Unix permissions, for example, RWX, RWX, RWX that you see, you typically uh, associate the first three bits with yourself, the next three bits with your group. Uh, maybe, you know, it is the 2020 MTech class. So all the users are grouped together that way. And the remaining is for the rest of the users, the rest of the computer science department, for example, and that's called the world. Okay, so instead of naming each individual user, you can actually group together users and store it in this compact fashion. Uh, and there are also systems that actually allow you to name individual users, that's also okay. But this particular way of storing the access control matrix by row is called the access control list based model of, uh, of, uh, of storing these permissions or ACLs, okay? So uh, that is one way of storing. And the key important thing over here is that the access permissions for a particular resource are stored with the resource itself or with the object itself. Okay, that's one way of storing things. So there is another way of storing things which is completely equivalent, right? Because your uh, information wise, it's exactly the same information. And that is by column, right? Which is to store the permissions for uh, uh, along with the subject. So together with each subject, you store the list of permissions that 
that particular subject has for various objects on that system. Okay, and that way of storing your access control matrix is called capabilities. Uh, and for the first half of today's lecture, we'll actually be talking a lot about capabilities and seeing some of the additional advantages that capabilities have over the traditional access control model, even though if you were to look at the information content of capabilities or ACLs, they're exactly the same. It's the access control matrix. But we'll see that from a software engineering point of view, capabilities bring certain advantages that ACLs don't have. And I will give you one example of that in the next few slides. Okay, so we've actually seen an example of capabilities in class. Uh, so you uh, want to take a minute to sort of guess what it is. We just saw it few lectures ago. Okay, and I will give you some hints over here, uh, uh, which will, which will uh, 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 allow you to guess what it is. So the key here is that the ownership of the capability, if somebody owns the capability, that grants that the holder of that capability, the access rights to that object, okay? And it must be non-forgeable. So the, those are the key important properties of capabilities. Anybody who owns the capability has got the, the will be given the, 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 the ability to perform that, that, that operation on the, on the object. And you, know, you will see that this is a concept that is going to play over and over, it's going to, so we will revisit capabilities, for example, when we study web security, okay? Uh, it's going to appear in a completely new context, but you will see that it is capabilities in disguise. Okay, so the answer here is file descriptors. Okay, so file descriptors are an example of capabilities. All right, so as I said, both ACLs as well as capabilities are equal in terms of expressive power because they are both representing the same access control matrix, but yet there are certain advantages to capabilities, okay? From a com completely from a software engineering point of view. And in order to illustrate this, I'm going to refer back to an old paper called The Confused Deputy Problem by Noam Hardy, which is actually one of the assigned readings for you. And uh, it's, a, it's a classic, it's a, it's a one pager. And you will see over here why you know, capabilities may potentially have been invented and why people sort of think about capabilities differently from how they think about ACLs, okay? So let us look at the setting that was in Noam Hardy's paper and you have to sort of understand the context uh, and a little bit of history to appreciate this, uh, this problem. Uh, so back when this paper was written, this was written in the 1970s, it was the era of the mainframe. It was not the era of the desktop computer. So it used to be that you had to actually rent time on this mainframe in order to run any sort of computation. Well, believe it or not, the same technology is actually coming back once again in the form of cloud computing. You're renting time on uh, public cloud servers to do exactly the same thing. So, the example that's talked about in Hardy's paper is this uh, is the example of this compiler. It was a Fortran compiler, but anyway, I will present it in a slightly more modern context. So let us say that you have a compiler and this compiler is going to take two inputs. Well, it's going to take three inputs, but let's focus on the first two in the, in the first place. It's going to take a file called foo.c and it's going to take the path name of where the output of the compilation of foo.c should be placed. It's a C compiler, okay? So it's going to compile foo.c and place the output wherever you ask it to place it, okay? So that's a dot out. So when the compiler outputs, it's going to put the stuff in a dot out. Now, this is a mainframe computer. So when you run your compiler on this mainframe computer, you know, the compiler is going to run for longer time if you give it a very large set of files or if it's going to run for a short time if you give it like a small file. Based on the amount of time that the compiler runs for you, it's going to bill you. So where is that information going to be stored? It is going to be stored based upon the number of cycles the compiler consumed, the amount of memory the compiler consumed and so on. Based on that, some bill is generated that's going to be stored in slash sys slash bill.txt. So it is going to be stored so the bill is going to be accumulated. Maybe it's accumulated at the end of the month and all the users are going to be sent their corresponding bill, okay? So you specify a third path name over here, sysbill.txt, and the compiler is just going to take all of these three things and then compile it this way. 
In fact, you don't even have to give this third argument. It may be built in into the compiler that the bill is always going to be in sysbill.txt and just takes two arguments. Doesn't really matter. Okay. But the idea is that the compiler puts the output of the compilation in whatever output file name you provide to it. And it also has access rights to go and uh, append to or write to this slash sysbuild.txt. Okay, that's very important. So in some sense, this compiler must have the privileges to write to this a.out and it must have at least append privileges to sysbuild.txt. Should I write permissions to a.out? And it should have append permissions to sysbuild.txt. Okay. Now, as you can imagine, sysbuild.txt is very much a shared file. It's an important file whose integrity is very important uh, because if anybody corrupts this bill, then you know you will end up printing or compiling your, your programs for free, and you're not going to be charged for the amount of work that the compiler has done for you. Okay. So protecting the integrity of the bill is very, very important. And so uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you can imagine that the sysbuild.txt is going to be owned by the system administrator and that not random people cannot write to it. End users of the system cannot write to this file. Okay. So in order, if given that that's the case, then we, it, and, and given the fact that the compiler must be able to write to the sysbuild.txt, we can establish the fact that the compiler must have both sets of privileges. What sets of privileges? Well, the privileges to write to this a.out file as well as the privileges to write to this sysbuild.txt file, okay? And you have seen this situation before, right? I mean, remember, you know, if you go back, if you walk your way back to the first or second lecture of the course, we spoke about exactly the same situation with the slash hc slash password file, okay? And we also spoke about a mechanism in Unix that enables this, right? And that is set UID. So the compiler we have established has both sets of privileges to write to a.out, .out, which is probably owned by the invoker of the compiler. So just the fact that that user is starting the compiler process automatically endows the compiler with write privileges for a.out. .out. Okay, but the uh, compiler must also have the privileges to write to this particular file, which is owned by the system administrator. So now I'm going to ask you the question, given the setting, uh, can you think of an attack where a malicious user tricks this compiler and forces it to corrupt this file, uh, thereby corrupting its integrity, slash sys slash build.txt, okay? And if you look carefully at this for a couple of seconds, the answer pops out, which is that a malicious user can simply invoke this compiler with slash sys slash build.txt as the path name of the file into which to place the output, okay? So you give foo.c as before, which the compiler is going to read, and then you give slash sys slash build.txt. And the third argument, as I said, is optional. It need not even be given. You can assume that the compiler will, in fact, just write to sys build.txt, or even if it is a third argument, you can specify whatever. It doesn't matter. But the point is that the second argument over here is provided as a path name, and the path name is provided as sys build.txt. And the compiler will just compile the program quietly as before and place the output in sysbuild.txt, thereby corrupting this file. Now, you can ask me, you know, isn't there an easy way to solve this problem? You know, can't the compiler check whether the path name over here is sysbuild.txt or slash sys or something like that, and then reject those kinds of file names? Well, you know, it, that may be a solution in this particular case, but remember, you know, there are soft links and hard links on Linux. So a file need not be named in a unique way. There are different ways of naming the file. And soon if you start enumerating the, the, the number of ways in which a particular file can be named, you'll run out of ideas or you will just have such a huge list of file names to protect that your compiler becomes unwieldy. So it is not possible to protect uh, writing into this, uh, into this slash, 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 uh, slash build.txt by simply performing simple checks with file names. Just because a Unix-like system allows aliases, okay? So we say in this particular case that this compiler is a confused deputy, okay? So what do we mean by confused deputy? So a confused deputy uh, is, uh, is the following, okay? So the compiler in this particular case is a confused deputy because it has two sets of access rights. 
So what are these access rights? So it has the access to write to this a.out file in, let's say, you know, that particular user's home directory. And it's in some sense given these rights by virtue of the fact that it is the user, it is the, that user, that, that, that uh, particular subject that starts the compiler process. That's access right number one. And it is also endowed with this access right to, to write to the slash sys slash build or text. Okay. That's given to it by default, either by set UID or whatever other mechanism, it has the privileges to write to the slash build or text. So why is it called a confused deputy? The reason it's called a confused deputy is because it does not know when to use which permission. Okay. It is given both sets of permissions. It says, look, you have the access to write to this file over here. It, you have got the access to write to that file over there. But it doesn't know which, when to use which permission. It has to use the permission to write to sysbuild.txt only to write the bill. And it has to use the permission to write the output only for the second input. But unfortunately, there is no easy way to program that unless you dramatically change the structure of the compiler, which means having to rewrite the compiler. Okay. And you can imagine that it is not possible to rewrite all programs that do file manipulation in this particular way. Okay, so we say that this set of permissions that this confused deputy or in this case the compiler has is called its ambient authority. Okay, that means that it's the set of permissions that it's somehow been endowed with. And what did the attacker do over here? Well, the attacker misused this ambient authority by getting this program to use the wrong authority in the wrong place. Okay, so that is the confused deputy problem. And in this particular case, the compiler is the, is the confused deputy. So as I said in the beginning of this course, you know, you might not remember all of the details, but 20 years down the, down the, down the road, what I want you to take away from this course is a set of tools that, or keywords that you will remember, okay? And here is one such important moment in the course, which is that whenever you think about the confused deputy problem, right? A light bulb must go on into your head, right? It must just go on. It, this confused deputy problem, whenever you are able to associate some problem that you're working with, with a confused deputy problem, immediately this light bulb should go on. And the solution is to use capabilities. Okay. So confused deputy means light bulb goes on, capabilities is the answer. So let's see how capabilities is the answer. Okay. So the particular example of capabilities that I'm going to use in this case is file descriptors. Okay, and we will see confused deputy prob uh, the confused deputy problem also making uh, an appearance when we talk about web security, in particular when we talk about something called cross-site request forgery. Okay, and there also capabilities is going to be the answer, but it's going to be a different form of capabilities. So in this particular case, the form of capabilities that is going to be our, that's going to come to our rescue as a solution mechanism is the, uh, is that of file descriptors. So let us see how this solution works with file descriptors. Okay. So the first thing we will do is that we will take this compiler and we will strip it of all of its access rights. In other words, this compiler by itself will not have the ability to open any file on its own. So if it, opens, if it issues an open command on any file, the operating system is going to throw an error. So you're going to strip the compiler of all of its access rights to open anything. Instead, what you're going to do is that the invoker of this program, okay, so in other words, the invoker of this compiler is going to open a.out for writing foo.c and, uh, uh, sorry, it's going to open a.out for writing and it's going to open foo.c for reading, and it's going to pass these file descriptors to the compiler. Okay, so the invoker of the program clearly has the ability to write to a.out. It is his own file after all. And he clearly has the ability to read from foo.c because again, it is a file that belongs to him. So he can issue these open commands. And once he gets these open commands, he's going to get back the file descriptor. And he would just pass these file descriptors to the compiler, right? Remember file descriptor passing two lectures ago? I told you that the parent process can pass file descriptors to the child process, or you can even send file descriptors via network sockets. All of those things are possible ways in which to send the uh, uh, capability to the compiler. 
So that's one part. The second, of course, is that the root or the admin will open the slash sys slash build or text with append permissions and pass that capability to the compiler. So the compiler or the invoker cannot themselves access sys build or text with open and any such accesses will fail. So how does this solve the problem? Well, even though the compiler does not have access to any of these resources, the capability to open foo.c with read permissions has been granted, capability to open a.out with write permissions has been granted, and the capability to append sysbuild.txt has also been granted, and the output is going to be placed in uh, this, this, this a.out. So even if the attacker were to do exactly the same thing, well, even if you were to give the capability over here to the compiler to sysbuild.txt over here, the, the capability to write to sysbuild.txt has not been generated by the file owner. Therefore, nobody can write to that sysbuild.txt. They can only append, but the initial integrity of the, of the file is still protected. The file cannot be overwritten. You only have append permissions. And the only person who can provide these append permissions is the root user because only they have the ability to go and open the sys build or text and provide uh, and, and ask for append permissions and the OS is going to grant it and give the file descriptor over to the uh, uh, system administrator. So all that is being passed to the compiler which has the ability to open nothing are the capabilities uh, in which the, uh, the particular access permissions in some sense have been embedded. So even if you were to provide a capability as a second argument over here, nothing will happen. You will append to it, but the original billing information will still be protected. Okay. So that is the confused deputy problem. And that is the particular solution to the confused deputy problem. Okay. With capabilities. So idea here is that the compiler has no ambient authority and the invoker or the administrator are obtaining the required capabilities and handing it over to the compiler, in some sense, therefore, blessing the compiler to do those particular operations. And the blessing comes from the fact that the capability has been passed to the compiler explicitly through the process of invocation. So I'm going to give you one more example of capabilities as you would see it in real life. So here is a second example of everyday use of capabilities versus access control lists. So let us say you're working on the shell and you want to list the contents of a file. How would you do it? The file is, let's say, called input.txt. Well, you'll say cat input.txt, okay? So if you do it in this particular way, essentially you're passing the full path name of the file to be opened uh, to the cat program. And the cat program is opening input.txt for reading. That's what it's doing over here. And that in that particular case, the cat is actually, you're relying on the access control list to ensure that input.txt is being given read permissions to cat. In this particular way of doing things, right? Supposing you were to use redirection with the greater than as the, the less than sign, maybe you're going to do cat less than symbol input.txt and greater than symbol output.txt. You are going to take input from input.txt and then print it out to output.txt. But this particular way of doing exactly the same thing instead uses capabilities. Why? There's a subtle difference. The difference is that in this particular way of invoking the program, the shell, the, the, the surrounding bash shell over here is the one that is actually responsible for opening input.txt because of this less than symbol. So it is the one that's going to open this input.txt and it's going to open it with read permissions. That's the less than symbol. Obtain the file descriptor for the corresponding read operation and pass it to cat. Likewise, it's going to uh, open output.txt dot, output with write permissions and pass those capabilities, that is the file descriptors to cat, and cat does not open the files on its own, okay? So even though these two are exactly, perform exactly the same thing with the minor difference that the output over here is being redirected to output.txt rather than std out, uh, this particular way is not using capabilities, this particular way is using capabilities, okay? So, so that's a, a practical example of, uh, of capabilities in action. Okay, so thus far we considered the problem of access control, um, which essentially concerns the problem of making spot decisions 
on whether a subject should be allowed access to a particular object or not. Uh, we didn't really think about any end-to-end -end properties of a system. So, you know, you have some secret in a file and maybe a user is able to read it. Uh, <clears throat> how do you subsequently reason about how that user is going to use that information, right? Uh, so in other words, we did not reason about how information flows within a system uh, once access has been granted to that resource. So in uh, this part of the lecture, we will now consider uh, the problem of how uh, information is going to be used in the system or how uh, subjects end up using the uh, access permissions that they have got to the particular object. So this is the subject of information flow control and uh, it's a very rich subject that continues to this day, but we will only be looking at two early models of information flow control. Uh, and this is going to be an example of a mandatory access control uh, uh, that is applied on the system. And we are going to be looking at two very influential policy models for information flow. And these were developed in the 60s and the 70s uh, uh, in the era of what is called multi-level access control. Okay, and there are modern incarnations of this as well. So in SE Linux and SE Android, you see examples of these policy models in action. So the two policy models that we are going to be talking about are Bell Lapadula or BLP, which is the policy model that we'll be using to enforce confidentiality properties on uh, objects in the system. And BIBA, which is the integrity policy model to protect the correctness of things in the system. Okay, so let us look at BLP first, uh, and then we will go on to BIBA. So the basic setup for understanding these policy models is to understand that both subjects and objects will have a notion of what are called labels. So because we are talking about BLP, these are going to be called confidentiality levels or confidentiality labels. Okay, so files will have confidentiality labels that indicate uh, the kind of sensitive information that are stored in those files. So for example, you can have a label, a label that says that the file is storing secret information or that it is storing public unclassified information or top secret information. In general, these levels actually form a hierarchy. They form a lattice, but we are not going to talk about uh, uh, lattices and so on. We are going to actually keep the discussion rather simple and elementary in this course. Okay. So we'll just assume that there are two levels. Maybe there is a secret level and there is a public level. Okay. Likewise, subjects can also have clearances that say what kind of data the subject can access. Okay, so a subject with secret clearance can access secret files and also public files. Uh, so there is an inherent hierarchy in these labels. So secret <coughs> users can access both secret as well as public files, whereas a user that has only public clearance cannot access secret files. Okay, so in order to understand Bell Lapadula, Baiba, and all of these things, one can talk about theory, but I'm actually going to talk about and motivate Bell Lapadula using an example. Okay, so we will motivate the whole thing using just this example, and then you will see that the concepts are actually pretty clear at the end of that. So let us take an example of a hypothetical company um, and uh, this company, let's just say, has um, two users, okay? So the name of the first user is Sundar, and the name of the second user is Pichai, okay? So S and P standing for secret and public. That's why I chose that name. No other reason, okay? So the user is Sundar, who has got secret clearance, and the other user is Pichai, who has got public clearance. On the other side, let's just say that this company only has two files, okay? Uh, one is some a file called hiringfiring.txt, which is basically a plan of who to hire and who to fire, okay? Um, and obviously that is very secret, right? You don't want to give that information away to the general public or to the employees of the company. So hiringfiring.txt is at secret level 
and this company like any good company these days serves free lunch in its cafeteria and the lunch menu for that particular day is always published in this file called lunch menu dot text and we will assume that that is public right everybody needs to know what the lunch in the cafeteria is so lunch menu dot text is a public file and hiring firing dot text is a secret file okay so in this setting let us say that you want to protect the confidentiality of secret files from public users how do you go about doing it okay so the fundamental way to do this is to determine who can read a resource and who can write to the resource so let us reason about that so let's reason about who can read resources so we'll draw a table right here is sundar here is pichai and here is hiring and here is lunch menu so can sundar read the file called hiring firing well the answer is yes right sundar has secret clearance hiring firing is a secret file there does not seem to be anything wrong with giving sundar read access to the hiring firing file can he read the lunch menu well he's a secret user but he's also a hungry user he needs to eat so he needs to be able to see the lunch menu okay so he can also see public files uh, can pichai see the lunch menu well he's a public user and the lunch menu is also public so pichai can also read the lunch menu but can pichai read the hiring firing file so he's just an average user of the of the company right he is not sundar he is not does not have secret clearance it is a secret file so pichai cannot read the hiring firing file okay so that all seems logical and this way of of uh, and it protects who can read what file right so what you have accomplished over here is that pichai is unable to read about his clearance level he is public he can read public files he can he cannot read secret files but sundar can read secret files and he can also read the lunch menu okay so this is called no read up no reading above your clearance level so that's as far as read goes now let us look at how writes are handled in the system and here is where a little bit of counterintuitive behavior comes so let's look at the easy cases okay so sundar can obviously write to the hiring filing file at the end of the day he has got secret clearance and the hiring firing uh, file is also secret so he can obviously write to it he is making the plan that that entry is easy okay so that's easy what about this entry right can picture write to the to the lunch menu well you know maybe this is a company that solicits requests for uh, lunch items from uh, all of the employees and so you know this is a public file this is a public uh, user public clearance user so you can write to it that also seems okay the complicated boxes are this and this okay so let's first look at this so sundar is is not allowed to write to the lunch menu why is that <coughs> why can't sundar write to the lunch menu file well the reason is because if he were allowed to write to the lunch menu there is a leak of possible information because sundar can read from the hiring firing file he can read that information and then subsequently write it to the lunch menu file from where pichai can actually go and read the information in the hiring firing okay so as to prevent these kinds of information flows in fact this would be an insider attack the bell and lapadula policy or blp states that sundar is not allowed to write to files that are below his clearance level okay if he were to write to any files that are below his clearance level because his clearance level is secret and the lunch menu file is public there is a chance that he can leak information that belongs to that clearance level to that particular confidentiality level and that is unacceptable okay and that is encoded using this term called no writes down you cannot write down below your security clearance level okay now the last box okay it i am going to ask you can picture write to the hiring firing file okay and although your 
intuition may suggest that pitch I should not be able to write to the hiring firing file. The box here says yes. Okay, pitch I can in fact write to the hiring firing file. So it's counterintuitive. So why is that? Well, the reason that Picha is allowed to write to this hiring firing file, according to Bell Lapadula, is because Bell Lapadula is primarily a confidentiality policy. It's not an integrity policy. If Picha were to write to the hiring firing file, he can corrupt the hiring firing file, but he will not leak the contents of hiring firing file. Okay. So even if Picha were allowed to write to this file, the confidentiality of this file is not corrupted. And therefore, because this policy is only protecting confidentiality, that operation is allowed. We will see now how to protect the hiring firing file from unauthorized rights by Pichai. But that is a problem of, of integrity, protecting integrity. It is not a problem of protecting confidentiality. And so that is orthogonal to Bell and Lapadula. And therefore, Bell and Lapadula says, fine, allow Pichai to write to the hiring firing file. Okay. So, Bell Lapadula can be summarized as follows. It is a no reads up and no writes down policy. Okay. So, that's for confidentiality. Just to make things very, very confusing, you will find that the policy for integrity is the exact opposite of this. And we will see that shortly. <clears throat> okay. So, let's just take the same problem. Okay. How to protect the integrity of things. Okay, it's a dual concept. And just like for Bell and Lapadula, we had this notion of confidentiality labels. Just like that in Baiba, we will assume that subjects and objects have what are called integrity labels and integrity clearances. Okay, so again, we will take the example of this hypothetical company with two users called Sundar and Pichai. And let us just say that this company has two files. Again, lunch menu and a file called accounts.xls, which stores all of the account details of this company, okay? Nothing is secret, but the correctness of these accounts is important because you don't want your balance sheets to be messed up, okay? So the correctness of the information in these files is of paramount importance, okay? And let us just assume that the users are given integrity clearances and files are given integrity labels. And we will call these integrity labels high and low. So a uh, high integrity label with a file means that the file is storing high integrity information that should not be corrupted. And a user having high integrity clearance means that the user is entrusted with, pro with, with, with outputting only high integrity information. Okay, he can only output high integrity information. So if Sundar starts the process, uh, that process will also get this integrity label and the output from that process can be trusted. That's what it means. So in contrast, a low integrity process is going to spew out incorrect information whose veracity or whose truth cannot be uh, 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 judged easily. Okay, and likewise, lunch menu dot text, you don't really care if its integrity is low, right? I mean, if instead of uh, vada sambar dip, you get idli sambar dip, no problem, right? I mean, your stomach is still full, even though the file got uh, corrupted, okay? So it does not matter. The integrity over here, uh, we will say is, uh, uh, it's a low integrity file, okay? So in order to protect integrity, let us sort of study what the policy model should be. And just as before, we will study who can read and who can write. So, you know, whenever you think about confidentiality, the first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, reads, I have to protect who can read. But as you saw, you should also think about who can protect, uh, how to protect rights. Just like that, when you think about integrity, the first thing that comes to mind is you want to control who can write things. And you will counterintuitively also see that it's important to understand who can read things. So let's study the right matrix first. Okay, so as far as rights go, Sundar, is allowed to write to accounts. Obviously, Sundar is a high integrity user, he's only going to produce high integrity information, accounts only stores high integrity uh, values and therefore this write is allowed. That seems logical and that in your intuition matches the table. Likewise, Sundar can also write to lunch menu. Okay, lunch menu 
is a low integrity file, but what does it matter even if a high integrity user writes to that file? It doesn't matter. Okay, let's look at this entry. Picha is a low integrity user. Lunch menu is a low integrity file. So it seems fine to allow that access, that write operation. But can Picha write to the accounts file, right? Picha is a low integrity user who produces untrustworthy information. So he can end up corrupting this accounts file and therefore Picha cannot write to the accounts file, okay? And so the way that we think about this is that we call this no writes up, okay? A low integrity user cannot write to a file whose label is above his integrity level, integrity clearance level, okay? So that is no writes up. Now let's look at reads, okay? Can Sundar read the accounts file? Well, Sundar has got high integrity clearance. The accounts file has got high integrity information. He can read it. So that seems logical. Let's look at this box, which is also easy to understand. Can Pichai read from the lunch menu? So it seems uh, logical to allow that. And so that's also allowed. Can Pichai, uh, can, can Sundar read from lunch menu? Well, the answer is no. The reason that Sundar cannot read from lunch menu is almost a mirror image of the argument of what we did for Bella Padula with respect to the right table over there. So the reason that Sundar cannot read from the lunch menu is because lunch menu is a low integrity file. If he reads information from untrustworthy sources, because he is allowed to write to high integrity uh, 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 files over here, potentially, there might be a, a, a corruption of the integrity of the high integrity file via this particular path if the read was allowed. Sundar can read from lunch menu and use that information to write to accounts.txt and therefore low integrity source such as lunch menu.txt will be allowed to affect the integrity of a high integrity file such as accounts.txt. And so in order to prevent such an attack, Sundar is not allowed to read from the lunch menu. Okay, and so that's a sad state of things. Sundar should just eat what he is given. He does not have the ability to read and choose from the lunch menu. Okay, and so that's called no reads down. Okay, no writes up, no reads down. Remember, look at Bella Padula. No reads up, no writes down. Bye bye is no writes up, no reads down. Okay, exact opposite. Nice situation for the midterm where I can get, create absolutely confusing questions. But anyway, I mean, uh, this sort of shows how confidentiality and integrity are exact duels of each other. Okay, so the last entry over here, why can't Pichai read from the accounts file? Okay, so, or, or why can he uh, read from the accounts file? <coughs> so accounts is high integrity and Pichai is a low integrity user. And he is allowed to read from a high integrity file. Nothing wrong if he reads from it. At the end of the day, in this particular model, we are not trying to control confidentiality. We are only trying to protect integrity. And the integrity of accounts.xls is not really corrupted by allowing Pichai to read from accounts.xls. And so that particular box is a checkbox. It's allowed. Okay. So therefore, bye bye integrity is no writes up and no reads down. So you might ask me, you know, are in confidentiality and integrity at odds with each other, right? And uh, if one is no reads up and no writes down, and the other one is no reads down and the no and, and no writes up, how can you accomplish anything in a system that where you want both integrity and confidentiality? Can you ever achieve both in the same system? And the answer is yes. Okay, it is important to remember that even though we spoke about no reads up and no writes down for Bella Padula, those policies were applied on the confidentiality labels. And although we spoke about no writes up and no reads down, those were applied on the integrity labels. One user or one resource on the system need not have the same label for both confidentiality and integrity. In fact, you will have two sets of labels, a confidentiality label and an integrity label. The confidentiality label is used together with the Bella Padula policy model and the integrity label is used together with the BIBA policy model. 
And based upon what you want to accomplish in your system deployment, based upon your security goals, you will set the security labels appropriately. So that concludes this lecture. Uh, um, although the lecture itself is rather short in duration, there is lot, quite a lot of confusing material in this lecture and also quite a bit of associated reading. So hopefully uh, this should keep you busy. And uh, as usual, please post any questions uh, or any confusions that you may have on the Teams group and I will be happy to answer those questions. Okay, thank you very much.